Section 16 of Orlando by Virginia Woolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Corey Samuel. Chapter 6, Part 2. Orlando walked up the street. Now that the poem was gone, and she felt a bare place in her breast where she had been used to carry it, she had nothing to do but reflect upon whatever she liked, the extraordinary chances it might be of the human lot. Here she was in St. James's Street, a married woman, with a ring on her finger. Where there had been a coffee-house once there was now a restaurant. It was about half-past three in the afternoon. The sun was shining. There were three pigeons, a mongrel terrier dog, two hansom cabs and a barouche landau. What, then, was life? The thought popped into her head violently, irrelevantly, unless old Green were somehow the cause of it. And it may be taken as a comment, adverse or favourable, as the reader chooses to consider it, upon her relations with her husband, who was at the horn, that whenever anything popped violently into her head she went straight to the nearest telegraph office and wired to him. There was one, as it happened, close at hand. "'My God, Shell!' she wired. "'Life, literature, green toady!' Here she dropped into a cipher language, which they had invented between them so that a whole spiritual state of the utmost complexity might be conveyed in a word or two, without the telegraph clerk being any wiser, and added the words, "'Rattigan Clumphobu, which summed it up precisely. For not only had the events of the morning made a deep impression on her, but it cannot have escaped the reader's attention that Orlando was growing up, which is not necessarily growing better. And Rattigan Glumphobu described a very complicated spiritual state, which, if the reader puts all his intelligence at our service, he may discover for himself. There could be no answer to her telegram for some hours. Indeed, it was probable, she thought, glancing at the sky, where the upper clouds raced swiftly past, that there was a gale at Cape Horn, so that her husband would be at the masthead, as likely as not, or cutting away some tattered spar, or even alone in a boat with a biscuit. And so, leaving the post-office, she turned to beguile herself into the next shop, which was a shop so common in our day that it needs no description, yet to her eyes strange in the extreme, a shop where they sold books. All her life long Orlando had known manuscripts. She had held in her hands the rough brown sheets on which Spencer had written in his little crabbed hand. She had seen Shakespeare's script and Milton's. She owned, indeed, a fair number of quartos and folios, often with a sonnet in her praise in them, and sometimes a lock of hair. But these innumerable little volumes, bright, identical, ephemeral, for they seemed bound in cardboard and printed on tissue paper, surprised her infinitely. The whole works of Shakespeare cost half a crown, and could be put in your pocket. One could hardly read them, indeed, the print was so small, but it was a marvel none the less. Works! The works of every writer she had known or heard of, and many more, stretched from end to end of the long shelves. On tables and chairs more works were piled, and tumbled, and these she saw, turning a page or two, were often works about other works by Sir Nicholas, and a score of others, whom, in her ignorance, she supposed, since they were bound and printed, to be very great writers too. So she gave an astounding order to the bookseller to send her everything of any importance in the shop, and left. She turned into Hyde Park which she had known of old. Beneath that cleft tree, she remembered, the Duke of Hamilton fell, run through the body by Lord Mohun. And her lips, which are often to blame in the matter, began framing the words of her telegram into a senseless sing-song. Life, literature, green, toady, rattigan, glumphobu. So that several park-keepers looked at her with suspicion, and were only brought to a favourable opinion of her sanity, by noticing the pearl necklace which she wore. She had carried off a sheaf of papers and critical journals from the bookshop, and at length, flinging herself on her elbow beneath a tree, 
she spread these pages round her, and did her best to fathom the noble art of prose composition as these masters practised it. For still the old credulity was alive in her, even the blurred type of a weekly newspaper had some sanctity in her eyes. So she read, lying on her elbow, an article by Sir Nicholas on the collected works of a man she had once known, John Donne. But she had pitched herself, without knowing it, not far from the serpentine. The barking of a thousand dogs sounded in her ears. Carriage-wheels rushed ceaselessly in a circle. Leaves sighed overhead. Now and again a braided skirt and a pair of tight scarlet trousers crossed the grass within a few steps of her. Once a gigantic rubber ball bounced on the newspaper. Violets, oranges, reds and blues broke through the interstices, broke through the interstices of the leaves and sparkled in the emerald on her finger. She read a sentence and looked up at the sky. She looked up at the sky and looked down at the newspaper. Life, literature, one to be made into the other. But how monstrously difficult! For, here came by a pair of tight scarlet trousers. How would Addison have put that? Here came two dogs dancing on their hind legs. How would Lamb have described that? For reading Sir Nicholas and his friends, as she did in the intervals of looking about her, she somehow got the impression. Here she rose and walked. They made one feel. It was an extremely uncomfortable feeling. One must never, never say what one thought. She stood on the banks of the serpentine. It was a bronze colour. Spider-thin boats were skimming from side to side. They made one feel, she continued, that one must always, always write like somebody else. The tears formed themselves in her eyes. For really, she thought, pushing a little boat off with her toe, I don't think I could. Here the whole of Sir Nicholas's article came before her, as articles do, ten minutes after they are read, with the look of his room, his head, his cat, his writing-table, and the time of the day thrown in. "'I don't think I could,' she continued, considering the article from this point of view. "'Sit in a study. No, it's not a study. It's a mouldy kind of drawing-room, all day long, and talk to pretty young men and tell them little anecdotes, which they mustn't repeat, about what Tupper said about smiles. And then, she continued, weeping bitterly, they're all so manly. And then, I do detest duchesses, and I don't like cake, and though I'm spiteful enough I could never learn to be as spiteful as all that, so how can I be a critic and write the best English prose of my time? Damn it all! she exclaimed, launching a penny steamer so vigorously that the poor little boat almost sank in the bronze-coloured waves. Now, the truth is that when one has been in a state of mind, as nurses call it, and the tears still stood in Orlando's eyes, the thing one is looking at becomes, not itself, but another thing, which is bigger and much more important, and yet remains the same thing. If one looks at the serpentine in this state of mind, the waves soon become just as big as the waves on the Atlantic, the toy boats become indistinguishable from ocean liners. So Orlando mistook the toy boat for her husband's brig, and the wave she had made with her toe for a mountain of water off Cape Horn. And as she watched the toy boat climb the ripple, she thought she saw Bonthrop's ship climb up and up a glassy wall. Up and up it went, and a white crest with a thousand deaths in it arched over it. And through the thousand deaths it went and disappeared. "'It's sunk!' she cried out in an agony. And then, behold, there it was again, sailing safe and sound among the ducks on the other side of the Atlantic. "'Ecstasy!' she cried. "'Ecstasy! Where's the post-office?' she wondered. "'For I must wire at once to Shell and tell him!' And repeating, "'A toy boat on the serpentine!' And, "'Ecstasy!' alternately, for the thoughts were interchangeable and meant exactly the same thing, she hurried towards Park Lane. "'A toy boat! A toy boat! A toy boat!' she repeated, 
thus enforcing upon herself the fact that it is not articles by Nick Green on John Dunn, nor eight-hour bills, nor covenants, nor factory acts that matter. It's something useless, sudden, violent, something that costs a life. Red, blue, purple, a spirit, a splash, like those hyacinths she was passing a fine bed of them, free from taint, dependence, soilure of humanity or care for one's kind, something rash, ridiculous, like my hyacinth, a husband, I mean, Bonthrop. That's what it is, a toy boat on the serpentine, ecstasy, it's ecstasy that matters. Thus she spoke aloud, waiting for the carriages to pass at the Stanhope Gate, for the consequence of not living with one's husband, except when the wind is sunk, is that one talks nonsense aloud in Park Lane. It would no doubt have been different had she lived all the year round with him as Queen Victoria recommended. As it was, the thought of him would come upon her in a flash. She found it absolutely necessary to speak to him instantly. She did not care in the least what nonsense it might make or what dislocation it might inflict on the narrative. Nick Green's article had plunged her in the depths of despair, the toy boat had raised her to the heights of joy. So she repeated, ecstasy, ecstasy, as she waited to cross. But the traffic was heavy that spring afternoon, and kept her standing there, repeating, ecstasy, ecstasy, or a toy boat on the serpentine, while the wealth and power of England sat, as if sculptured, in hat and cloak, in foreign hand, Victoria and Baruch Landau. It was as if a golden river had coagulated and massed itself in golden blocks across Park Lane. The ladies held card-cases between their fingers, the gentlemen balanced gold-mounted canes between their knees. She stood there, gazing, admiring, awestruck. One thought only disturbed her, a thought familiar to all who behold great elephants, or whales of an incredible magnitude, and that is, how do these leviathans, to whom obviously stress, change, and activity are repugnant, propagate their kind? Perhaps, Orlando thought, looking at the stately, still faces, their time of propagation is over, this is the fruit, this is the consummation. What she now beheld was the triumph of an age. Portly and splendid there they sat. But now the policeman let fall his hand, the stream became liquid, the massive conglomeration of splendid objects moved, dispersed and disappeared into Piccadilly. So she crossed Park Lane, and went to her house in Curzon Street, where, when the meadow sweet blew there, she could remember Curlew calling and one very old man with a gun. She could remember, she thought, stepping across the threshold of her house, how Lord Chesterfield had said. But her memory was checked. Her discreet eighteenth-century hall, where she could see Lord Chesterfield putting his hat down here and his coat down there, with an elegance of deportment which it was a pleasure to watch, was now completely littered with parcels. While she had been sitting in Hyde Park, the bookseller had delivered her order and the house was crammed. There were parcels slipping down the staircase, with the whole of Victorian literature done up in grey paper and neatly tied with string. She carried as many of these packets as she could to her room, ordered footmen to bring the others, and, rapidly cutting innumerable strings, was soon surrounded by innumerable volumes. Accustomed to the little literatures of the sixteenth, seventeenth, and eighteenth centuries, Orlando was appalled by the consequences of her order. For, of course, to the Victorians themselves, Victorian literature meant not merely four great names, separate and distinct, but four great names sunk and embedded in a mass of Alexander Smiths, Dixons, Blacks, Millmans, Buckles, Taines, Paines, Tuppers, Jamesons, all vocal, clamorous, prominent, and requiring as much attention as anybody else. Orlando's reverence for print had a tough job set before it, but drawing her chair to the window to get the benefit of what light might filter between the high houses of Mayfair, 
she tried to come to a conclusion. And now it was clear that there are only two ways of coming to a conclusion upon Victorian literature. One is to write it out in sixty volumes octavo, the other is to squeeze it into six lines the length of this one. Of the two courses, economy, since time runs short, leads us to choose the second, and so we proceed. Orlando then came to the conclusion, opening half a dozen books, that it was very odd that there was not a single dedication to a nobleman among them. Next, turning over a vast pile of memoirs, that several of these writers had family trees half as high as her own. Next, that it would be impolitic in the extreme to wrap a ten-pound note round the sugar-tongs when Miss Christina Rossetti came to tea. Next, here were half a dozen invitations to celebrate centenaries by dining, that literature, since it ate all these dinners, must be growing very corpulent. Next, she was invited to a score of lectures upon the influence of this upon that, the classical revival, the romantic survival, and other titles of the same engaging kind. That literature, since it listened to all these lectures, must be growing very dry. Next, here she attended a reception given by a peeress. That literature, since it wore all those fur tippets, must be growing very respectable. Next, here she visited Carlyle's soundproof room at Chelsea. That genius, since it needed all this coddling, must be growing very delicate. And so at last she reached her final conclusion, which was of the highest importance, but which, as we have already much overpassed our limit of six lines, we must omit. Orlando, having come to this conclusion, stood looking out of the window for a considerable space of time. For, when anybody comes to a conclusion, it is as if they had tossed the ball over the net, and must wait for the unseen antagonist to return it to them. What would be sent her next from the colourless sky above Chesterfield House, she wondered. And, with her hands clasped, she stood for a considerable space of time wondering. Suddenly she started, and here we could only wish that, as on a former occasion, purity, chastity, and modesty would push the door ajar, and provide, at least, a breathing space, in which we could think how to wrap up what now has to be told delicately, as a biographer should. But no, having thrown their white garment at the naked Orlando, and seen it fall short by several inches, these ladies had given up all intercourse with her these many years, and were now otherwise engaged. Is nothing, then, going to happen this pale March morning, to mitigate, to veil, to cover, to conceal, to shroud this undeniable event, whatever it may be? For after giving that sudden, violent start, Orlando— But heaven be praised! At this very moment there struck up outside one of these frail, reedy, fluty, jerky, old-fashioned barrel-organs, which are still sometimes played by Italian organ-grinders in back streets. Let us accept the intervention, humble though it is, as if it were the music of the spheres, and allow it, with all its gasps and groans, to fill this page with sound, until the moment comes when it is impossible to deny its coming, which the footman has seen coming, and the maid-servant, and the reader will have to see too, for Orlando herself is clearly unable to ignore it any longer. Let the barrel-organ sound and transport us on thought, which is no more than a little boat, when music sounds, tossing on the waves, on thought, which is of all carriers the most clumsy, the most erratic, over the rooftops and the back gardens where washing is hanging, to— What is this place? Do you recognise the green, and in the middle the steeple, and the gate with the lion couchant on either side? Oh, yes, it is Q. Well, Q will do. So here we are at Q, and I will show you to-day, the second of March, under the plum-tree, a grape hyacinth, and a crocus, and a bud, too, on the almond-tree, so that to walk there is to be thinking of bulbs, hairy and red, thrust into the earth in October, flowering now, and to be dreaming of more than can rightly be said, and to be taking from its case a cigarette or cigar even, 
and to be flinging a cloak under, as the rhyme requires, an oak. And there to sit, waiting the kingfisher, which, it is said, was seen once to cross in the evening from bank to bank. Wait, wait, the kingfisher comes, the kingfisher comes not. Behold, meanwhile, the factory chimneys and their smoke, behold the city clerks flashing by in their outrigger, behold the old lady taking her dog for a walk, and the servant girl wearing her new hat for the first time, not at the right angle, behold them all. Though heaven has mercifully decreed that the secrets of all hearts are hidden, so that we are lured on for ever to suspect something, perhaps, that does not exist. Still, through our cigarette smoke, we see blaze up and salute the splendid fulfilment of natural desires for a hat, for a boat, for a rat in a ditch, as once one saw blazing. Such silly hops and skips the mind takes when it slops like this all over the saucer, and the barrel organ plays, saw blazing a fire in a field against minarets near Constantinople. Hail, natural desire! Hail, happiness, divine happiness, and pleasure of all sorts, flowers and wine, though one fades and the other intoxicates, and half-crown tickets out of London on Sundays, and singing in a dark chapel hymns about death, and anything, anything that interrupts and confounds the tapping of typewriters and filing of letters, and forging of links and chains, binding the empire together. Hail even the crude red bows on shop-girls' lips, as if Cupid, very clumsily, dipped his thumb in red ink and scrawled a token in passing. Hail happiness, kingfisher flashing from bank to bank, and all fulfilment of natural desire, whether it is what the male novelist says it is, or prayer, or denial. Hail in whatever form it comes, and may there be more forms, and stranger. For dark flows the stream. Would it were true, as the rhyme hints, like a dream, but duller and worser than is our usual lot, without dreams but alive, smug, fluent, habitual, under trees whose shade of an olive green drowns the blue of the wing of the vanishing bird when he darts of a sudden from bank to bank. Hail happiness, then, and after happiness, Hail not those dreams which blot the sharp image, as spotted mirrors do the face in a country inn parlour. Dreams which splinter the whole and tear us asunder, and wound us and split us apart in the night when we would sleep. But sleep, sleep, so deep that all shapes are ground to dust of infinite softness, water of dimness inscrutable, and there, folded, shrouded, like a mummy, like a moth, prone let us lie on the sand at the bottom of sleep. But wait, but wait, we are not going, this time, visiting the blind land. Blue, like a match struck right in the ball of the innermost eye, he flies, burns, bursts the seal of sleep, the kingfisher, so that now floods back, refluent like a tide, the red, thick stream of life again, bubbling, dripping, and we rise, and our eyes, for how handy a rhyme is to pass us safe over the awkward transition from death to life, fall on. Here the barrel organ stops playing abruptly. "'It's a very fine boy, my lady,' said Mrs. Banting, the midwife, putting her first-born child into Orlando's arms. In other words, Orlando was safely delivered of a son, on Thursday, March the 20th, at three o'clock in the morning. End of section 16「Section 17 of Orlando by Virginia Woolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Corrie Samuel. Chapter 6, Part 3 Once more Orlando stood at the window. But let the reader take courage. Nothing of the same sort is going to happen to-day, which is not by any means the same day. No. 
for if we look out of the window, as Orlando was doing at the moment, we shall see that Park Lane itself has considerably changed. Indeed one might stand there, ten minutes or more, as Orlando stood now, without seeing a single barouche Landau. "'Look at that!' she exclaimed, some days later, when an absurd truncated carriage without any horses began to glide about of its own accord. "'Carriage without any horses, indeed!' She was called away just as she said that, but came back again after a time, and had another look out of the window. It was odd sort of weather nowadays. The sky itself, she could not help thinking, had changed. It was no longer so thick, and so watery, so prismatic, now that King Edward—see, there he was, stepping out of his neat brougham to go and visit a certain lady opposite—had succeeded Queen Victoria. The clouds had shrunk to a thin gauze, the sky seemed made of metal, which in hot weather tarnished verdigris, copper-colour or orange, as metal does in a fog. It was a little alarming, this shrinkage. Everything seemed to have shrunk. Driving past Buckingham Palace last night, there was not a trace of that vast erection which she had thought everlasting. Top-hats, widows' weeds, trumpets, telescopes, wreaths, all had vanished, and left not a stain, not a puddle even, on the pavement. But it was now. After another interval she had come back again to her favourite station in the window. Now, in the evening, that the change was most remarkable. Look at the lights in the houses. At a touch a whole room was lit. Hundreds of rooms were lit, and one was precisely the same as the other. One could see everything in the little square-shaped boxes. There was no privacy none of those lingering shadows and odd corners that there used to be, none of those women in aprons carrying wobbly lamps, which they put down carefully on this table and on that. At a touch the whole room was bright. And the sky was bright all night long, and the pavements were bright, everything was bright. She came back again at midday. How narrow women have grown lately! They looked like stalks of corn straight, shining, identical, and men's faces were as bare as the palm of one's hand. The dryness of the atmosphere brought out the colour in everything, and seemed to stiffen the muscles of the cheeks. It was harder to cry now. Water was hot in two seconds. Ivy had perished or been scraped off houses. Vegetables were less fertile. Families were much smaller. Curtains and covers had been frizzled up, and the walls were bare, so that new brilliantly coloured pictures of real things, like streets, umbrellas, apples, were hung in frames or painted upon the wood. There was something definite and distinct about the age, which reminded her of the eighteenth century, except that there was a distraction, a desperation. As she was thinking this, the immensely long tunnel in which she seemed to have been travelling for hundreds of years widened, the light poured in, her thoughts became mysteriously tightened and strung up, as if a piano-tuner had put his key in her back and stretched the nerves very taut. At the same time her hearing quickened, she could hear every whisper and crackle in the room, so that the clock ticking on the mantelpiece beat like a hammer. And so for some seconds the light went on, becoming brighter and brighter, and she saw everything more and more clearly, and the clock ticked louder and louder, until there was a terrific explosion right in her ear. Orlando leapt as if she had been violently struck on the head. Ten times she was struck. In fact, it was ten o'clock in the morning. It was the eleventh of October. It was 1928. It was the present moment. No one need wonder that Orlando started, pressed her hand to her heart, and turned pale. For what more terrifying revelation can there be than that it is the present moment? That we survive the shock at all is only possible, because the past shelters us on one side, and the future on another. But we have no time now for reflections. Orlando was terribly late already. She ran downstairs. She jumped into her motor-car. 
she pressed the self-starter and was off. Vast blue blocks of building rose into the air, the red cowls of chimneys were spotted irregularly across the sky, the road shone like silver-headed nails. Omnibuses bore down upon her with sculptured, white-faced drivers. She noticed sponges, bird-cages, boxes of green American cloth. But she did not allow these sights to sink into her mind even the fraction of an inch as she crossed the narrow plank of the present, lest she should fall into the raging torrent beneath. "'Why don't you look where you're going to? Put your hand out, can't you?' That was all she said sharply as if the words were jerked out of her. For the streets were immensely crowded, people crossed without looking where they were going. People buzzed and hummed round the plate-glass windows, within which one could see a glow of red, a blaze of yellow, as if they were bees, Orlando thought. But her thought that they were bees was violently snipped off, and she saw, regaining perspective with one flick of her eye, that they were bodies. "'Why don't you look where you're going?' she snapped out. At last, however, she drew up at Marshall and Snellgrove's and went into the shop. Shade and scent enveloped her. The present fell from her like drops of scalding water. Light swayed up and down like thin stuffs puffed out by a summer breeze. She took a list from her bag, and began reading in a curious stiff voice at first, as if she were holding the words, boys' boots, bath salts, sardines, under a tap of many-coloured water. She watched them change as the light fell on them. Bath and boots became blunt, obtuse, sardines serrated itself like a saw. So she stood in the ground-floor department of Messrs. Marshall and Snellgrove, looked this way and that, snuffed this smell and that, and thus wasted some seconds. Then she got into the lift, for the good reason that the door stood open, and was shot smoothly upwards. The very fabric of life now, she thought as she rose, is magic. In the eighteenth century we knew how everything was done, but here I rise through the air, I listen to voices in America, I see men flying, but how it's done I can't even begin to wonder so my belief in magic returns. Now the lift gave a little jerk as it stopped at the first floor, and she had a vision of innumerable coloured stuffs flaunting in a breeze, from which came distinct, strange smells. And each time the lift stopped and flung its doors open, there was another slice of the world displayed with all the smells of that world clinging to it. She was reminded of the river off Wapping in the time of Elizabeth, where the treasure-ships and the merchant-ships used to anchor. How richly and curiously they had smelt! How well she remembered the feel of rough rubies running through her fingers when she dabbled them in a treasure-sack! And then, lying with Suki, or whatever her name was, and having Cumberland's lantern flashed on them. The Cumberlands had a house in Portland Place now, and she had lunched with them the other day, and ventured a little joke with the old man about almshouses in the Sheen Road. He had winked. But here, as the lift could go no higher, she must get out, heaven knows into what department, as they called it. She stood still to consult her shopping list, but was blessed if she could see, as the list bade her, bath salts or boys' boots anywhere about. And indeed she was about to descend again, without buying anything, but was saved from that outrage by saying aloud automatically the last item on her list, which happened to be, "'Sheets for a double bed.' "'Sheets for a double bed,' she said to a man at a counter. And, by a dispensation of providence, it was sheets that the man at that particular counter happened to sell. For Grimsditch—no, Grimsditch was dead. Bartholomew—no, Bartholomew was dead. Louise, then. Louise had come to her in a great taking the other day, for she had found a hole in the bottom of the sheet in the royal bed. Many kings and queens had slept there—Elizabeth, James, Charles, George, Victoria, Edward—no wonder the sheet had a hole in it. But Louise was positive she knew who had done it. It was the Prince Consort. "'Sal Bosch,' she said, 
for there had been another war, this time against the Germans. "'Sheets for a double bed,' Orlando repeated dreamily, for a double bed, with a silver counterpane, in a room fitted in a taste which she now thought perhaps a little vulgar, all in silver, but she had furnished it when she had a passion for that metal. While the man went to get sheets for a double bed, she took out a little looking-glass and a powder-puff. Women were not nearly as roundabout in their ways, she thought, powdering herself with the greatest unconcern, as they had been when she herself first turned woman, and lay on the deck of the enamoured lady. She gave her nose the right tint deliberately. She never touched her cheeks. Honestly, though she was now thirty-six, she scarcely looked a day older. She looked just as pouting, as sulky, as handsome, as rosy, like a million candled Christmas tree, Sasha had said, as she had done that day on the ice, when the Thames was frozen and they had gone skating. "'The best Irish linen, ma'am,' said the shopman, spreading the sheets on the counter, and they had met an old woman picking up sticks. Here, as she was fingering the linen abstractedly, one of the swing-doors between the departments opened, and let through, perhaps from the fancy goods department, a whiff of scent, waxen, tinted as if from pink candles, and the scent curved like a shell round a figure. Was it a boy's, or was it a girl's? Young, slender, seductive, a girl by God, furred, pearled, in Russian trousers, but faithless, faithless! Faithless! cried Orlando. The man had gone, and all the shop seemed to pitch and toss with yellow water, and far off she saw the masts of the Russian ship standing out to sea. And then, miraculously, perhaps the door opened again, the conch which the scent had made became a platform, a dais, of which stepped a fat, furred woman, marvellously well preserved, seductive, diademed, a Grand Duke's mistress. She who, leaning over the banks of the Volga, eating sandwiches, had watched men drown, and began walking down the shop towards her. "'Oh, Sasha!' Orlando cried. Really she was shocked that she should have come to this. She had grown so fat, so lethargic, and she bowed her head over the linen, so that this apparition of a grey woman in fur, and a girl in Russian trousers, with all these smells of wax candles, white flowers, and old chips that it brought with it, might pass behind her back unseen. "'Any napkins, towels, dusters to-day, ma'am?' the shopman persisted and it is enormously to the credit of the shopping-list, which Orlando now consulted, that she was able to reply with every appearance of composure, that there was only one thing in the world she wanted, and that was bath-salts, which was in another department. But descending in the lift again, so insidious is the repetition of any scene, she was again sunk far beneath the present moment, and thought, when the lift bumped on the ground, that she heard a pot broken against a river-bank. As for finding the right department, whatever it might be, she stood engrossed among the handbags, deaf to the suggestions of all the polite, black, combed, sprightly shop-assistants, who, descending as they did equally, and some of them perhaps as proudly, even from such depths of the past as she did, chose to let down the impervious screen of the present, so that to-day they appeared shop-assistants in Marshall and Snellgrove's merely. Orlando stood there hesitating. Through the great glass doors she could see the traffic in Oxford Street. Omnibus seemed to pile itself upon omnibus, and then to jerk itself apart. So the ice-blocks had pitched and tossed that day on the Thames. An old nobleman, in furred slippers, had sat astride one of them, there he went, she could see him now, calling down maledictions upon the Irish rebels. He had sunk there, where her car stood. "'Time has passed over me,' she thought, trying to collect herself. "'This is the oncome of middle age. How strange it is! Nothing is any longer one thing. I take up a handbag, and I think of an old bumboat woman frozen in the ice. Someone lights a pink candle, and I see a girl in Russian trousers. 
when I step out of doors, as I do now. Here she stepped onto the pavement of Oxford Street. What is it that I taste? Little herbs. I hear goat bells. I see mountains. Turkey, India, Persia. Her eyes filled with tears. That Orlando had gone a little too far from the present moment will, perhaps, strike the reader, who sees her now, preparing to get into her motor-car with her eyes full of tears and visions of Persian mountains. And indeed it cannot be denied that the most successful practitioners of the art of life, often unknown people, by the way, somehow contrive to synchronise the sixty or seventy different times which beat simultaneously in every normal human system, so that when eleven strikes, all the rest chime in unison, and the present is neither a violent disruption, nor completely forgotten in the past. Of them we can justly say that they live precisely the sixty-eight or seventy-two years allotted them on the tombstone. Of the rest, some we know to be dead, though they walk among us. Some are not yet born, though they go through the forms of life. Others are hundreds of years old, though they call themselves thirty-six. The true length of a person's life, whatever the Dictionary of National Biography may say, is always a matter of dispute. For it is a difficult business, this time-keeping. Nothing more quickly disorders it than contact with any of the arts, and it may have been her love of poetry that was to blame for making Orlando lose her shopping-list, and start home without the sardines, the bath-salts, or the boots. Now as she stood with her hand on the door of her motor-car, the present again struck her on the head. Eleven times she was violently assaulted. "'Confound it all!' she cried, for it is a great shock to the nervous system, hearing a clock strike, so much so that for some time now there is nothing to be said of her, save that she frowned slightly, changed her gears admirably, and cried out, as before, "'Look where you're going!' Don't you know your own mind? Why didn't you say so, then?" While the motor-car shot, swung, squeezed, and slid, for she was an expert driver, down Regent Street, down Haymarket, down Northumberland Avenue, over Westminster Bridge, to the left, straight on, to the right, straight on again. The Old Kent Road was very crowded on Thursday, the 11th of October, 1928 people spilt off the pavement. There were women with shopping-bags. Children ran out. There were sales at drapers' shops. Streets widened and narrowed. Long vistas steadily shrunk together. Here was a market. Here a funeral. Here a procession with banners upon which was written, Ra, Un. But what else? Meat was very red. Butchers stood at the door. Women almost had their heels sliced off. Amor vin. That was over a porch. A woman looked out of a bedroom window, profoundly contemplative and very still. Applejohn and Applebed under t Nothing could be seen whole or red from start to finish. What was seen begun, like two friends starting to meet each other across the street, was never seen ended. After twenty minutes the body and mind were like scraps of torn paper tumbling from a sack, and indeed the process of motoring fast out of London so much resembles the chopping up small of identity which precedes unconsciousness and perhaps death itself, that it is an open question in what sense Orlando can be said to have existed at the present moment. Indeed, we should have given her over for a person entirely disassembled, were it not that here, at last, one green screen was held out on the right, against which the little bits of paper fell more slowly, and then another was held out on the left, so that one could see the separate scraps now turning over by themselves in the air. And then green screens were held continuously on either side, so that her mind regained the illusion of holding things within itself, and she saw a cottage, a farmyard, and four cows, all precisely life-size. When this happened, Orlando heaved a sigh of relief, lit a cigarette, and puffed for a minute or two in silence. Then she called, hesitatingly, 
as if the person she wanted might not be there. Orlando? For if there are, at a venture, seventy-six different times all ticking in the mind at once, how many different people are there not? Heaven help us, all having lodgment at one time or another in the human spirit. Some say two thousand and fifty-two. So that it is the most usual thing in the world for a person to call, directly they are alone, Orlando, if that is one's name, meaning by that, come, come, I'm sick to death of this particular self, I want another. Hence the astonishing changes we see in our friends. But it is not altogether plain sailing, either, for though one may say, as Orlando said, being out in the country and needing another self, presumably, Orlando. Still, the Orlando she needs may not come. These selves of which we are built up, one on top of another, as plates are piled on a waiter's hand, have attachments elsewhere, sympathies, little constitutions and rights of their own. Call them what you will. And for many of these things there is no name. So that one will only come if it is raining, another in a room with green curtains, another when Mrs. Jones is not there, another if you can promise it a glass of wine, and so on. For everybody can multiply from his own experience the different terms which his different selves have made with him, and some are too wildly ridiculous to be mentioned in print at all. So Orlando, at the turn by the barn, called, Orlando, with a note of interrogation in her voice, and waited. Orlando did not come. "'All right, then,' Orlando said, with the good humour people practice on these occasions, and tried another. For she had a great variety of selves to call upon, far more than we have been able to find room for, since a biography is considered complete if it merely accounts for six or seven selves, whereas a person may well have as many thousand. Choosing, then, only those selves we have found room for, Orlando may now have called on the boy who cut the nigger's head down, the boy who strung it up again, the boy who sat on the hill, the boy who saw the poet, the boy who handed the queen the bowl of rose-water, or she may have called upon the young man who fell in love with Sasha, or upon the courtier, or upon the ambassador, or upon the soldier, or upon the traveller, or she may have wanted the woman to come to her, the gypsy, the fine lady, the hermit the girl in love with life, the patroness of letters, the woman who called Ma, meaning hot baths and evening fires, or Shelmadine, meaning crocuses in autumn woods, or Bonthrop, meaning the death we die daily, or all three together, which meant more things than we have space to write out. All were different, and she may have called upon any one of them. Perhaps, But what appeared certain, for we are now in the region of perhaps and appears, was that the one she needed most kept aloof, for she was, to hear her talk, changing herself as quickly as she drove. There was a new one at every corner. As happens when, for some unaccountable reason, the conscious self, which is the uppermost, and has the power to desire, wishes to be nothing but one self. This is what some people call the true self, and it is, they say, compact of all the selves we have it in us to be, commanded and locked up by the captain self, the key self, which amalgamates and controls them all. Orlando was certainly seeking this self, as the reader can judge from overhearing her talk as she drove. And if it is rambling talk, disconnected, trivial, dull and sometimes unintelligible, It is the reader's fault for listening to a lady talking to herself. We only copy her words as she spoke them, adding in brackets which self, in our opinion, is speaking, but in this we may well be wrong. "'What, then, who, then?' she said. Thirty-six, in a motor-car, a woman. Yes, but a million other things as well. A snob am I, the garter in the hall, the leopards, my ancestors, proud of them. Yes. Greedy, luxurious, vicious. Am I?" Here a new self came in. "'Don't care a damn if I am. 
Truthful? I think so. Generous? Oh, but that doesn't count. Here a new self came in. Lying in bed of a morning, listening to the pigeons on fine linen. Silver dishes, wine, maids, footmen. Spoilt? Perhaps. Too many things for nothing. Hence my books. Here she mentioned fifty classical titles, which represented, so we think, the early romantic works that she tore up. Facile, glib, romantic. But— Here another self came in. A duffer, a fumbler, more clumsy I couldn't be. And, and— Here she hesitated for a word, and if we suggest love we may be wrong, but certainly she laughed and blushed, and then cried out, A toad set in emeralds, Harry the Archduke, blue bottles on the ceiling. Here another self came in. But Nell, Kit, Sasha— she was sunk in gloom, tears actually shaped themselves, and she had long given over crying. Trees, she said. Here another self came in. I love trees. She was passing a clump, growing there a thousand years. And barns. She passed a tumble-down barn at the edge of the road. And sheep-dogs. Here one came trotting across the road. She carefully avoided it and the night. But people. Here another self came in. People? She repeated it as a question. I don't know. Chattering, spiteful, always telling lies. Here she turned into the high street of her native town, which was crowded, for it was market day, with farmers and shepherds and old women with hens in baskets. I like peasants. I understand crops. But— Here another self came skipping over the top of her mind, like the beam from a lighthouse. Fame! She laughed. Fame! Seven editions! A prize! Photographs in the evening papers! Here she alluded to the oak tree, and the Burdett Cout's memorial prize which she had won, and we must snatch space to remark how discomposing it is for her biographer that this culmination to which the whole book moved, this peroration with which the book was to end, should be dashed from us on a laugh casually like this. But the truth is that when we write of a woman, everything is out of place. Culminations and perorations, the accent never falls where it does with a man. Fame, she repeated, a poet, a charlatan, both every morning as regularly as the post comes in. To dine, to meet, to meet, to dine, fame, fame. She had here to slow down to pass through the crowd of market people, but no one noticed her. A poor voice in a fishmonger's shop attracted far more attention than a lady who had won a prize, and might, had she chosen, have worn three coronets, one on top of another, on her brow. Driving very slowly, she now hummed, as if it were part of an old song. With my guineas I'll buy flowering trees, flowering trees, flowering trees, and walk among my flowering trees, and tell my sons what fame is." So she hummed, and now all her words began to sag here and there, like a barbaric necklace of heavy beads. "'And walk among my flowering trees,' she sang, accenting the words strongly, and see the moon rise slow the wagons go." Here she stopped short, and looked ahead of her intently at the bonnet of the car, in profound meditation. "'He sat at Twitchit's table,' she mused, with a dirty ruff on. Was it old Mr. Baker come to measure the timber, or was it sh here? For when we speak names we deeply reverence to ourselves, we never speak them whole." She gazed for ten minutes ahead of her letting the car come almost to a standstill. "'Haunted!' she cried, suddenly pressing the accelerator. "'Haunted ever since I was a child! There flies the wild goose! It flies past the window out to sea! Up I jumped!' She gripped the steering-wheel tighter, and stretched after it. But the goose flies too fast. I've seen it here! There! There!' 
England, Persia, Italy. Always it flies fast out to sea, and always I fling after it words like nets. Here she flung her hand out, which shrivel as I've seen nets shrivel, drawn on deck with only seaweed in them, and sometimes there's an inch of silver, six words, in the bottom of the net, but never the great fish who lives in the coral groves. Here she bent her head, pondering deeply. And it was at this moment, when she had ceased to call Orlando, and was deep in thoughts of something else, that the Orlando whom she had called came of its own accord, as was proved by the change that now came over her. She had passed through the lodge gates, and was entering the park. End of section 17「Section 18 of Orlando」by Virginia Woolf. This Legamus recording may be distributed and adapted freely for any purpose. Chapter 6 Part 4 The whole of her darkened and settled, as when some foil whose addition makes the round and solidity of a surface is added to it, and the shallow becomes deep and the near distant, and all is contained as water is contained by the sides of a well. So she was now darkened, stilled, and become, with the addition of this Orlando, what is called, rightly or wrongly, a single self, a real self. And she fell silent. For it is probable that when people talk aloud, the selves, of which there may be more than two thousand, are conscious of disseverment, and are trying to communicate, but when communication is established they fall silent. Masterfully, swiftly, she drove up the curving drive between the elms and oaks, through the falling turf of the park, whose fall was so gentle that had it been water it would have spread the beach with a smooth green tide. Planted here and in solemn groups were beech-trees and oak-trees. The deer stepped among them, one as white as snow, another with its head on one side, for some wire netting had caught in its horns. All this, the trees, deer and turf, she observed with the greatest satisfaction, as if her mind had become a fluid that flowed round things and enclosed them completely. Next minute she drew up in the courtyard, where, for so many hundred years she had come, on horseback or in coach and six, with men riding before or coming after, where plumes had tossed, torches flashed, and the same flowering trees that let their leaves drop had now shaken their blossoms. Now she was alone. The autumn leaves were falling. The porter opened the great gates. "'Morning, James,' she said. "'There's some things in the car. Will you bring them in?' Words of no beauty, interest or significance themselves, it will be conceded, but now so plumped out with meaning that they fell like ripe nuts from a tree and proved that when the shrivelled skin of the ordinary is stuffed out with meaning, it satisfies the senses amazingly. This was true indeed of every movement and action now, usual though they were, so that to see Orlando change her skirt for a pair of whipcord breeches and leather jacket, which she did in less than three minutes, was to be ravished with the beauty of movement, as if Madame Lopakova were using her highest art. Then she strode into the dining-room where her old friends, Dryden, Pope, Swift, Addison, regarded her demurely at first as who should say, here's the prize-winner. But when they reflected that two hundred guineas was in question, they nodded their heads approvingly. Two hundred guineas, they seemed to say, two hundred guineas are not to be sniffed at. She cut herself a slice of bread and ham, clapped the two together and began to eat, striding up and down the room thus shedding her company habits in a second, without thinking. After five or six such turns, she tossed off a glass of red Spanish wine, and filling another, which she carried in her hand, strode down the long corridor and through a dozen drawing-rooms, and so began a perambulation of the house, attended by such elk-hounds and spaniels as chose to follow her. This, too, was all in the day's routine. As soon would she come home and leave her own grandmother without a kiss, 
as come back and leave the house unvisited. She fancied that the rooms brightened as she came in, stirred, opened their eyes, as if they had been dozing in her absence. She fancied, too, that, hundreds and hundreds of times as she had seen them, they never looked the same twice, as if so long a life as theirs had stored in them a myriad moods, which changed with winter and summer, bright weather and dark, and her own fortunes and the people's characters who visited them. Polite they always were to strangers, but a little wary. With her they were entirely open and at their ease. Why not, indeed? They had known each other for close on four centuries now. They had nothing to conceal. She knew their sorrows and joys. She knew what age each part of them was, and its little secrets, a hidden drawer, a concealed cupboard, or some deficiency, perhaps, such as a part made up or added later. They, too, knew her in all her moods and changes. She had hidden nothing from them, had come to them as boy and woman, crying and dancing, brooding and gay. In this window-seat she had written her first verses. In that chapel she had been married. And she would be buried here, she reflected, kneeling on the window-sill in the long gallery and sipping her Spanish wine. Though she could hardly fancy it, the body of the heraldic leopard would be making yellow pools on the floor, the day they lowered her to lie among her ancestors. She, who believed in no immortality, could not help feeling that her soul would come and go for ever with the reds on the panels and the greens on the sofa. For the room, she had strolled into the ambassador's bedroom, shone like a shell that has lain at the bottom of the sea for centuries, and has been crusted over and painted a million tints by the water. It was rose and yellow, green and sand-coloured. It was frail as a shell, as iridescent, and as empty. No ambassador would ever sleep there again. Ah! but she knew where the heart of the house still beat. Gently opening a door, she stood on the threshold, so that, as she fancied, the room could not see her, and watched the tapestry rising and falling on the eternal faint breeze which never failed to move it. Still the hunter rode, still Daphne flew. The heart still beat, she thought, however faintly, however far withdrawn, the frail, indomitable heart of the immense building. Now, calling her troop of dogs to her, she passed down the gallery whose floor was laid with whole oak trees sawn across. Rows of chairs, with all their velvets faded, stood ranged against the wall, holding their arms out for Elizabeth, for James, for Shakespeare it might be, for Cecil who never came. The sight made her gloomy. She unhooked the rope that fenced them off. She sat on the Queen's chair. She opened a manuscript book lying on Lady Betty's table. She stirred her fingers in the aged rose-leaves. She brushed her short hair with King James's silver brushes. She bounced up and down upon his bed. But no king would ever sleep there again, for all Louise's new sheets, and pressed her cheek against the worn silver counterpane that lay upon it. But everywhere were little lavender bags to keep the moth out, and printed notices, Please do not touch, which, though she had put them there herself, seemed to rebuke her. The house was no longer hers entirely, she sighed. It belonged to time now, to history, was past the touch and control of the living. Never would beer be spilt here any more, she thought. She was in the bedroom that had been old Nick Green's, or holes burnt in the carpet. Never two hundred servants come running and brawling down the corridors with warming pans and great branches for the great fireplaces. Never would ale be brewed and candles made and saddles fashioned and stone shaped in the workshops outside the house. Hammers and mallets were silent now. Chairs and beds were empty. Tankards of silver and gold were locked in glass cases. The great wings of silence beat up and down the empty house. So she sat at the end of the gallery, with her dogs couched round her, in Queen Elizabeth's hard armchair. The gallery stretched far away to a point where the light almost failed. 
it was as a tunnel bored deep into the past. As her eyes peered down it, she could see people laughing and talking, the great men she had known, Dryden, Swift, and Pope, and statesmen in colloquy, and lovers dallying in the window-seats, and people eating and drinking at the long tables, and the wood-smoke curling round their heads and making them sneeze and cough. Still further down she saw sets of splendid dancers formed for the quadrille. A fluty, frail, but nevertheless stately music began to play. An organ boomed. A coffin was borne into the chapel. A marriage procession came out of it. Armed men with helmets left for the wars. They brought banners back from Flodden and Poitiers and stuck them on the wall. The long gallery filled itself thus, and still peering further, she thought she could make out at the very end, beyond the Elizabethans and the Tudors, someone older, further, darker, a cowled figure, monastic, severe, a monk who went with his hands clasped and a book in them, murmuring. Like thunder the stable-clock struck four. Never did any earthquake so demolish a whole town. The gallery and all its occupants fell to powder. Her own face, that had been dark and sombre as she gazed, was lit as by an explosion of gunpowder. In this same light everything near her showed with extreme distinctness. She saw two flies circling round, and noticed the blue sheen on their bodies. She saw a knot in the wood where her foot was, and her dog's ear twitching. At the same time she heard a bough creaking in the garden, a sheep coughing in the park, a swift screaming past the window. Her own body quivered and tingled, as if suddenly stood naked in a hard frost. Yet she kept, as she had not done when the clock struck ten in London, complete composure, for she was now one and entire, and presented, it may be, a larger surface to the shock of time. She rose, but without precipitation, called her dogs, and went firmly, but with great alertness of movement, down the staircase and out into the garden. Here the shadows of the plants were miraculously distinct. She noticed the separate grains of earth in the flower-bed, as if she had a microscope stuck to her eye. She saw the intricacy of the twigs of every tree. Each blade of grass was distinct, and the marking of veins and petals. She saw Stubbs, the gardener, coming along the path, and every button on his gaiters was visible. She saw Betty and Prince the cart-horses, and never had she marked so clearly the white star on Betty's forehead, and the three long hairs that fell down below the rest on Prince's tail. Out in the quadrangle the old grey walls of the house looked like a scraped new photograph. She heard the loudspeaker condensing on the terrace a dance tune that people were listening to in the Red Velvet Opera House at Vienna. Braced and strung up by the present moment, she was also strangely afraid, as if, whenever the gulf of time gaped and let a second through, some unknown danger might come with it. The tension was too relentless and too rigorous to be endured long without discomfort. She walked more briskly than she liked, as if her legs were moved for her, through the garden and out into the park. Here she forced herself, by a great effort, to stop by the carpenter's shop, and to stand stock-still watching Joe Stubbs fashion a cart-wheel. She was standing with her eye fixed on his hand when the quarter struck. It hurtled through her like a meteor, so hot that no fingers can hold it. She saw with disgusting vividness that the thumb on Joe's right hand was without a finger-nail, and there was a raised saucer of pink flesh where the nail should have been. The sight was so repulsive that she felt faint for a moment. But in that moment's darkness, when her eyelids flickered, she was relieved of the pressure of the present. There was something strange in the shadow that the flicker of her eyes cast, something which, as any one can test for himself by looking now at the sky, is always absent from the present, whence its terror, its nondescript character, something one trembles to pin through the body with a name and call beauty, for it has no body, 
is as a shadow without substance or quality of its own, yet has the power to change whatever it adds itself to. This shadow now, while she flickered her eye in its faintness in the carpenter's shop, stole out, and attaching itself to the innumerable sights she had been receiving, composed them into something tolerable, comprehensible. Her mind began to toss like the sea. Yes, she thought, heaving a deep sigh of relief, as she turned from the carpenter's shop to climb the hill. I can begin to live again. I'm by the serpentine, she thought. The little boat is climbing through the white arch of a thousand deaths. I am about to understand. Those were her words, spoken quite distinctly, but we cannot conceal the fact that she was now a very indifferent witness to the truth of what was before her, and might easily have mistaken a sheep for a cow, or an old man called Smith for one who was called Jones, and was no relation of his whatever. For the shadow of faintness which the thumb without a nail had cast had deepened now, at the back of her brain, which is the part furthest from sight, into a pool where things dwell in darkness so deep that what they are we scarcely know. She now looked down into this pool or sea in which everything is reflected, and indeed some say that all our most violent passions, and art and religion, are the reflections which we see in the dark hollow at the back of the head, when the visible world is obscured for the time. She looked there now, long, deeply, profoundly, and immediately the ferny path up the hill along which she was walking became not entirely a path, but partly the serpentine. The hawthorn bushes were partly ladies and gentlemen, sitting with card-cases and gold-mounted canes. The sheep were partly tall, mayfair houses. Everything was partly something else, as if her mind had become a forest with glades branching here and there. Things came nearer, and further, and mingled and separated, and made the strangest alliances and combinations in an incessant chequer of light and shade. Except when Canute, the elk-hound, chased a rabbit, and so reminded her that it must be about half-past four. It was indeed twenty-three minutes to six. She forgot the time. The ferny path led, with many turns and windings, higher and higher to the oak-tree which stood on the top. The tree had grown bigger, sturdier, and more knotted since she had known it, somewhere about the year 1588, but it was still in the prime of life. The little sharply frilled leaves were still fluttering thickly on its branches. Flinging herself on the ground, she felt the bones of the tree running out like ribs from a spine this way and that beneath her. She liked to think that she was riding the back of the world. She liked to attach herself to something hard. As she flung herself down, a little square book, bound in red cloth, fell from the breast of her leather jacket, her poem, The Oak Tree. I should have brought a trowel, she reflected. The earth was so shallow over the roots that it seemed doubtful if she could do as she meant and bury the book here. Besides, the dogs would dig it up. No luck ever attends these symbolical celebrations, she thought. Perhaps it would be as well, then, to do without them. She had a little speech on the tip of her tongue, which she meant to speak over the book as she buried it. It was a copy of the first edition, signed by author and artist. I bury this as a tribute, she was going to have said, a return to the land of what the land has given me. But, Lord, once one began mouthing words aloud, how silly they sounded! She was reminded of old Green getting upon a platform the other day, comparing her with Milton, save for his blindness, and handing her a cheque for two hundred guineas. She had thought then of the oak tree here on its hill, and what has that got to do with this? she had wondered. What has praise and fame to do with poetry? What has seven editions, the book had already gone into no less, got to do with the value of it? Was not writing poetry a secret transaction, a voice answering a voice? So that all this chatter and praise and blame, and meeting people who admired one, and meeting people who did not admire one, was as ill-suited as could be to the thing itself, a voice answering a voice. 
What could have been more secret, she thought, more slow, and like the intercourse of lovers, than the stammering answer she had made all these years to the old crooning song of the woods, and the farms, and the brown horses standing at the gate, neck to neck, and the smithy, and the kitchen, and the fields, so laboriously bearing wheat, turnips, grass, and the garden blowing iris and fritillaries. So she let her book lie, unburied and dishevelled on the ground, and watched the vast view, varied like an ocean floor this evening, with the sun lightening it, and the shadows darkening it. There was a village with a church tower among elm trees, a grey domed manor house in a park, a spark of light burning on some glass house, a farmyard with yellow corn stacks. The fields were marked with black tree clumps, and beyond the fields stretched long woodlands, and there was the gleam of a river, and then hills again. In the far distance Snowdon's crags broke white among the clouds. She saw the far Scottish hills and the wild tides that swirl about the Hebrides. She listened for the sound of gun-firing out at sea. No, only the wind blew. There was no war to-day. Drake had gone. Nelson had gone. And there, she thought, letting her eyes, which had been looking at these far distances, drop once more to the land beneath her, was my land once. That castle between the downs was mine, and all that moor running almost to the sea was mine. Here the landscape—it must have been some trick of the fading light—shook itself, heaped itself, let all this encumbrance of houses, castles, and woods slide off its tent-shaped sides. The bare mountains of Turkey were before her. It was blazing noon. She looked straight at the baked hillside. Goats cropped the sandy tufts at her feet. An eagle soared above. The raucous voice of old Rustam, the gypsy, croaked in her ears. What is your antiquity and your race and your possessions compared with this? What do you need with four hundred bedrooms and silver lids on all your dishes, and housemaids dusting? At this moment some church clock chimed in the valley. The tent-like landscape collapsed and fell. The present showered down upon her head once more. But now that the light was fading, gentlier than before, calling into view nothing detailed, nothing small, but only misty fields, cottages with lamps in them, the slumbering bulk of a wood, and a fan-shaped light pushing the darkness before it along some lane. Whether it had struck nine, ten, or eleven, she could not say. Night had come. Night that she loved of all times. Night in which the reflections in the dark pool of the mind shine more clearly than by day. It was not necessary to faint now in order to look deep into the darkness, where things shape themselves, and to see in the pool of the mind, now Shakespeare, now a girl in Russian trousers, now a toy boat on the serpentine, and then the Atlantic itself, where it storms in great waves past Cape Horn. She looked into the darkness. There was her husband's brig, rising to the top of the wave. Up it went, and up and up. The white arch of a thousand deaths rose before it. Oh, rash! Oh, ridiculous man, always sailing so uselessly round Cape Horn in the teeth of a gale! But the brig was through the arch and out on the other side. It was safe at last. Ecstasy! she cried. Ecstasy! And then the wind sank, the waters grew calm, and she saw the waves rippling peacefully in the moonlight. Marmaduke Bonthrop Shelmardine! she cried, standing by the oak tree. The beautiful glittering name fell out of the sky like a steel-blue feather. She watched it fall, turning and twisting, like a slow-falling arrow that cleaves the deep air beautifully. He was coming, as he always came, in moments of dead calm, when the wave rippled and the spotted leaves fell slowly over her foot in the autumn woods, when the leopard was still, the moon was on the waters, 
and nothing moved in between sky and sea. Then he came. All was still now. It was near midnight. The moon rose slowly over the weald. Its light raised a phantom castle upon earth. There stood the great house, with all its windows robed in silver. Of wall or substance there was none. All was phantom. All was still. All was lit as for the coming of a dead queen. Gazing below her, Orlando saw dark plumes tossing in the courtyard, and torches flickering and shadows kneeling. A queen once more stepped from her chariot. "'The house is at your service, ma'am,' she cried, curtsying deeply. "'Nothing has been changed. The dead lord, my father, shall lead you in.' As she spoke, the first stroke of midnight sounded. The cold breeze of the present brushed her face with its little breath of fear. She looked anxiously into the sky. It was dark with clouds now. The wind roared in her ears. But in the roar of the wind she heard the roar of an aeroplane coming nearer and nearer. "'Here, Shell, here!' she cried, bearing her breast to the moon, which now showed bright, so that her pearls glowed, like the eggs of some vast moon-spider. The aeroplane rushed out of the clouds and stood over her head. It hovered above her. Her pearls burnt like a phosphorescent flare in the darkness. And as Shelmerdine, now grown a fine sea-captain, hale, fresh-coloured and alert, leapt to the ground, there sprung up over his head a single wild bird. "'It is the goose!' Orlando cried. The wild goose! And the twelfth stroke of midnight sounded. The twelfth stroke of midnight, Thursday, the eleventh of October, nineteen hundred and twenty eight. End of section eighteen. End of Orlando by Virginia Woolf. Recorded by Corrie Samuel.